Recently, I sat down with the former Deputy Chief Justice Dikang Moseneke to trace his steps and to tell his life story. And this is the first part of the two-part interview. And tonight we're talking to the former Deputy Chief Justice Dikang Moseneke and we're very honored indeed to be talking to him. Remo Seneke, Mukwena, Rale Boha. Thank you very much for giving us the interview. Good evening, Remedy, sir. And uh, wonderful much to see you. Much appreciated. You know, before I start talking to you about your experience as a member of the Constitutional Court and a senior leader at that and former advocate and so on, I'm actually reminded of uh, how some of us grew up in and around Tswane, Pretoria at the time, that you were such a towering figure then. And now that I'm talking to you from your home, it takes me back to that time that you've been a very, very influential figure in many people's lives for many years. And for that, we are very much grateful. Mm. I'm very thankful. Thank you for so much. A very emotional moment for you when you stepped down and you gave your last remarks as the Deputy Chief Justice. Uh, how, how did you feel on the day? Was it the day that you were working towards or on the day you realized that this is where the road ends? No. <clears throat> Excuse me, remember that we have a fixed term yeah. in our constitution and we chose a fixed term for very good reason. Um, nobody holds power forever in our constitutional arrangements. Mm. So I, I've always known the term, I've always known when it will end, so it wasn't a surprise. It wasn't like somebody calling up my card and saying you've got to go. Mm. I think it was the I was overcome by the deep gratitude mm. that it was possible mm. to have a journey of 40 years at Robben Island, 50 years, and yet come to the end of it feeling so accomplished and privileged. Mm. Um, it is just, I think, that sudden deep realization that I've always believed and hoped that God will bless Africa mm. and bless her people. And that I tried to do that in my own life, mm. in a little way, to advance that particular wish, that prayer, that hope that our people will, will become better mm. one day. And that's part of explanation. But I was, yes, I was overwhelmed. And I looked around, um, half the people in court were, were crying too, together with me. Uh, so it was, it was quite a moment. Now, the, just to check the years, you, you spend uh, a certain amount of time on Robben Island and then you've been in law for how long? 50 years only? For 40 long? years. 40 years. Yes. Can you just give me the breakdown? Of 40 years, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> it's basically from 1976 to 2016, mm. so that's 40 years. Remember, I came out of Robben Island in 1973, mm. did articles from 1974 to 1976 when I was admitted as an attorney. Mm -hmm. And so from then on to now, and then remember, I practiced as an attorney at the law firm here in Pretoria, Maluleke Sirita and Moseneke. Mm. And we had offices in Harangua and mm. offices in, in the city, in Pretoria. Mm. Uh, and Pretoria were here lawfully because the group Edas Egg didn't allow us. Uh, and, but we continued to practice here, as you know, and we served our people all around here mm. and hoped that they would charge us, you know, for contravening the group Edas Act. They never did, and we were very disappointed. Because <laughs> <laughs> that would have shot us into stardom. Everybody would have known of this law firm. Yes that the apartheid government is trying to throw out of uh, the CBD of, of Tswani. They never did that, but the, the firm. So from there, I moved on after five years. I wanted to be an advocate. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to practice in the Supreme Court and to defend our people there because we always had to brief only white advocates. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I can do this. And I went there. Um, and it was wonderful. I mean, the balance of my career was there. So of the 45 as an attorney, um, maybe another 20, 15, 20 as an advocate, I became a senior counsel mm. and I appeared in cases that we can talk about if you're interested in to my heart's content. Mm. 
and I became a senior counsel whilst I was a slave, I like saying, Tim, I had no right to vote. You and me could not vote, mm. but I had this big title of being senior counsel. Mm. And I had Mr. Declair give me letters patent to say you're a top ranking advocate with the title of senior counsel, mm. a C behind your name. Mm. And yet I had no vote, and yet I was a victim of apartheid, mm. like all of us, mm. excluded <clears throat> in many ways. And then um, came 19, uh, 1990. Mm. And again, I can tell the whole tale about the struggle. Well, I'll, I'll go back to that. I just want to talk about uh, the most recent times. Uh, well, but let's see, since 94 up to now, the Constitutional Court, a very, very important institution in our nation. And of course, the most recent ruling about uh, the National Assembly and the President, again, putting the workings of the Constitutional Court under the spotlight. How has the experience been like for you, the time that you spend at the Constitutional Court? I was 15 years old in all as a judge, and of the 15, 14 years, I was at the Constitutional Court. Mm. So, in that 14 years, it has been, I sometimes can't explain what a blessing it was. And I sometimes think, if I'd stayed on doing other things and not at the court, I think my life would have been far less accomplished than now. This is what it meant. It really meant I was one of the 11 people who were final arbiters on whether or not the Constitution has been complied with, mm. on whether all laws that Parliament pass are consistent with the Constitution. Let me pause to remind you that in the olden days of apartheid, we had something called parliamentary sovereignty. When Parliament made a law, nobody could test it, mm. challenge it, and, 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 and see whether in fact it complies with a higher law. Mm. But because on the current system our constitution is supreme, we're able to test even laws made by parliament. Mm. So we have a supremacy of the constitution in that sense that um, everything gets tested. So there I was, one of the, the 11 who would have the privilege to do that. And you know, Ramadi said, I mean, from that time to now, I can run through a number of cases. Yes, but they move up to Inca and like case, but in between, there are many others. And my final case, of course, on education, mm. access to education. To what extent, then, I'm going to ask, it's a general question, and then I'll come back to the specific, the particular. Mm. To what extent are judges who sit on the Constitutional Court independent? Because politicians have now and again question that thing that you are human, you are the same as themselves, and therefore you shouldn't be the final arbiters on, uh, on, uh, on their actions. But of course you do so in the context of the Constitution. Simple answer to that. Um, <clears throat> when you put together a Constitution, you must decide who would blow the whistle. Of course, going back to a soccer image, referees are human. Mm. And they, but they, we trust them to make decisions that would be true, that would be honest, and that would be permitted within the rules. Mm. They might privately like Kaiser Chiefs, or they might privately like Mamelodi Sundowns, as I do, okay? But, but judges are trained right through the, for instance, the time that I was a lawyer, to develop what we call a dispassionate disposition, to an impartial, appreciation of what is before you. This you do while you are an advocate, while you present a case. Mm. From the one side, will be another side, and you'll see judges sifting through all of that to mm. come to an outcome. Mm. So yes, I mean, it takes training over years and time. Two, we train judges, and I did a lot of that whilst I was there training young judges. You require them to be honest. So to act with integrity. So they wouldn't knowingly cheat you or try and cheat you. Mm. The outcomes, from my experience, in our courts generally would be 
honest understanding of the facts and the law by a judge and will put out an outcome. But the system acknowledges that judges are fallible. So, you know, people are not telling us something new. Yes. That is why you have three chances in the courts, maybe four. If you start the magistrate's court, you can appeal to the high court for, to one judge. You can appeal to a full bench. You can appeal to the Supreme Court of Appeals, and ultimately you come to us. Mm. So those are sieves. The job is to sift the process so that you reduce the margin of error mm. and you increase the impartiality. And lastly, the higher you go, the more the judges. That's why at Crucial Court, we're 11. So if somebody's going to crook you or be dishonest or be partial, you must get all 11 judges to collaborate with that impartiality. Mm. It's almost impossible, Tim. So you must convince every of the 11 judges of the Constitutional Court in order to get an outcome that is only against a particular person or party mm. or mm. corporation. For you personally, I mean, please bear with me when I jump here and I go there. I mm -hmm. mean, you uh, went to Robben Island, you were arrested and, uh, and imprisoned at age 15. Frankly, you are still a child, very much young. And I suppose in today's South Africa, irrespective of any crimes that you would have committed, you would not be sentenced to spend time in prison with grown people. Yes. But in your case, it, it happened. Did that in any way affect you, your outlook on life, and leave you with scars and resentment to any group of people? Tim, no. I mean, um, affect me, yes, of course. Um, I didn't think I was young. I thought I was equal to the task. Yes. Um, and also, I like putting this in context. Remember that after that, I defended many young people who were rioting, mm. who were, you know, um, and the party laws had removed that exemption for children. So you could be sentenced as a child. Currently, it's almost impossible to do it because child is defined in a particular way and courts are obliged to do a whole range of things, mm. you know, like diversion and other things to keep people below 18 out of jail. Apartheid law was not like that, yes. on political offenses. Yes. They send you to jail summarily. But one had to immediately grow up instantly and very quickly. And two, on Robben Island, we spend a lot of time to focus on how a just society should look like. Remember the fortune was that I was thrown into the midst of many leaders mm. of incredible standing. Um, they had no political public power, but they had influence and there were giants of our struggle. Um, whether you're talking about that is Zephania Mutuping, or you're talking about Dati Nelson Mandela, or you're talking about Harry Guala, or Dati John Pokela, you could go on and on and on. People like Steve Tretter were there with us. Uh, people like uh, Johnson Lambo were there with us. And um, so think about them, they were there. Our current president, mm. President Jacob Zuma, mm. was there with us and we're all young and we're all, all part of a struggle. So, or Ahmed Katrada or name it. So the fortune, the fortune was being thrown um, you know, in the middle of these people who understood that this was just not mere punishment for some misdemeanor. In fact, it was a wrong conviction, and our duty was to think through how will we reconstruct society. Now, with that kind of experience, having spent time with some of the leaders that you mentioned at a much uh, earlier age, to what extent then would you say that prepared you for the role you ultimately played as uh, one of the leaders, members of the Constitutional Court and the Deputy Chief Justice? And of course, along the way, there are other things that happened which we will talk oh, yes. about. But by the time you were given this responsibility of sitting on the Constitutional Court, do you ever reflect on it or did you ever reflect on how it, was, it had shaped you and your outlook? Um, yeah. <clears throat> during your time as member of Constitutional Court? 
Of course, it was a very big influence in my life. Um, you know, the notion that government is for the people, we all say it. It's not only by the people, but for the people. And we, we glibly run over it and we sound knowledgeable and so on. But in it sits a very vital commitment. And public power is conferred not to confer importance on people. Public power is conferred so that we can advance the interest of a select group of people that we could call a nation or citizens in a country. <clears throat> That's really the only purpose that public power is given. So those things I took to heart quite seriously, frankly. I, and those we were taught in Robben Island. And we understood them to be so. So once I got there, it was no brainer to know that here's the law, here's the constitution. It has been drafted in order to advance and change the lives of people. You, the Khang Museneke, must do your work to make sure that it does what it is intended to do. But there's an argument in South Africa <coughs> that the constitution constrains those in power, the political parties, the government, to effect the necessary changes that should transform our society. Things like uh, the protection of property rights being mentioned, and that's why there's land hunger, there's lack of transformation in business, and the economic um, opportunities for people are limited as a result of this constitution. So now and again, there will be politicians who suggest that let's throw this constitution away and come up with something else. What do you think? They're entirely wrong. They're totally wrong. You see, the constitution represents what I often call our common convictions. It constitutes the best minimum agreement amongst us. Um, of course, it is open to amendment. If the two thirds of us change, may change it, as you know. But it represents a collection of our aspirations. And if anything, it is transformative in its nature. The Constitution promises equality. It promises inclusion. It envisages that everybody would have the right to pursue their trade in a way that is possible, open. It requires the state to create an inclusive economy. It sets in place in Section 25 that is often quoted, mechanisms that allow the state to achieve an equitable use and distribution of land. Mm. It has those mechanisms in there. You may or may not like the idea that there may be compensation, but the Constitution requires compensation, okay? And we can have a debate, a political mm. debate, whether there should be or not. Mm. I'm not doing that, because I was that referee who blows according to the rules. And I wasn't going to impose my preferences over that. So our Constitution, properly used, demands transformation. It hopes for access to housing for our people, access to education, access to quality health care. So we cannot hide behind it as something that is unuseful, it's highly useful. So where do you think then, you know, this is for the benefit of the nation, including oh, yes. the leaders of people, their representatives, to understand and appreciate the Constitution as a tool that can be used for transformation. Now, mm. when leaders themselves complain about the Constitution, it definitely can be very confusing. So from where you are sitting, what, where do you think the shortcoming lies? Look, I, I really do think, I don't think any document could be perfect and the Constitution is perfect. Um, I have written, as you know, one time, I was asked to point out the four areas where we could improve on our constitution, and I did so, to some quite a response. I mean, about how we have dispersed power, mm. how we have dealt with the land question, 
how we've dealt with issues around access to healthcare education and so on. So I have in the past shown areas which can be improved on the Constitution itself. So I'm not blinded to the notion that, but you see, freedom require ground rules. Inclusive economic activity requires ground rules. Um, and moving society from a bad space to a good space, we need rules to be able to do that. And if, as we know out of human experience, if all of us have public power, have it open-ended, repression and greed and impunity replaces the rule of law. So the notion of the rule of law is not some liberal, <coughs> crazy notion that sits out there. It's actually a cry out by the people to say, when we deal with each other, let's have the ground rules clear, upfront, known. And you who have the power must exercise it in terms of those ground rules. You can't take money anytime, anyhow, outside the budgetary process or within the budget and use it in ways that are inconsistent with the budget and the law and treasury regulations and so on, you're acting unlawfully. And somebody ought to blow that whistle. And judges are ordinarily required to say you have acted unlawfully. So no, we need the rules if we are to preserve and if we are to make the lives of our people better. Leave it to the hands of those who have public power we might be in deep danger. And the examples are many on our own continent and somewhere else in the world. I'm talking to the former Deputy Chief Justice, Dikhang Moseneke, and we are talking about his life and times as member of the Constitutional Court, as well as talking about his very compelling life story that has served as an inspiration to so many of us. We'll be talking to him next time.